Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Well, it's another Manifest program today, coming to you from the city of Jerusalem. Now, I want you to stay with me. If you've never stayed with an entire Manifest telecast, I'm going to give you two, actually, it's, it's more than two, but two revelations that in my lifetime of preaching 34 years, I did not know till two weeks ago. Yeah, now think about that. Now, I want to ask you a question. What does it mean to be on the right hand of God or on the left hand of God? A lot of people may not know how to answer that. If you will go to the scripture, we're going to go to the book of Job in a moment. Job said that he was living on the left hand of God where he does work, doth work. And if you go into, for example, the, the Jewish thought of the right and the left hand, you know, at, at creation, there was darkness and light created. And the Jewish concept was that light was on the right hand and, and the darkness was on the left hand. And then if you go into some of the concepts of the Ten Commandments, they talk about the ones where thou shalt, which are positive, and thou shalt not, which are to some considered negative. And they say that the positive ones were created by the right hand, the negative ones on the left hand. Now, for all you left-handed folks out there, <laughs> has nothing to do with whether or not you're left-handed when you write or right-handed when you write. I thought I would go ahead and say that for my dad's a lefty, my brother's a lefty, all right? So it has no bearing on that whatsoever. But it's, it's, like, it's like looking at it and using sort of a metaphor to talk about the good and the bad. Job, we're going to go there now, and I'm going to show you some nuggets from the book of Job. And I'm going to show you something that, to me, really stirred me up. Earlier in my ministry, there was a movement that started called the Word of Faith Movement. Great movement. Many of my friends are in the Word of Faith Movement. But when they read the book of Job, they made Job a book that dealt strictly with confession. In other words, Job's confession may have gotten off or he didn't say the right thing. And that's why he went under the attack that he did. I'm going to show you in a few moments that the key of the book of Job has to do with blood and sacrifices not so much with confession. It is tied to confession, but let's just go there instead of talking about it. Okay, Job chapter 1, there was a man in the land of Uz, not uh, Oz, by the way, the land of Uz, Uz, which is believed to be uh, south, south of Edom in the land of Esau, in the land of the Gentiles, uh, perhaps somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, the man was perfect and upright, feared God and shunned evil. Notice three things. He was upright. Number two, he feared God. Number three, he shunned evil. There was born to him seven sons and three daughters, or a total of ten children. His substance was also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very great household. And this man, now look at this phrase, was the greatest in the east. Now the east in the Bible always alludes to the land of Israel, what's east of it. So that would be in the territory, you start thinking about it, going toward India and Afghanistan and Pakistan and Persia and all those countries to the east. He was the greatest man out of all that territory. Now here's what happens. And, uh, it, it, and his sons went and feasted on their houses every one in his day and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, now this is important, verse 5 is a key verse. It was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Ten children, that means he put ten offerings on the altar, one for every child, that it, it, because he said it may be my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. This Job did continually. So here's what he's doing. He's building an altar, and he's putting 10 individual sacrifices on that altar, one representing each child. Now, here's a nugget for you. There was a day, not days, but a single day, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, Hasatan, the adversary, came among them. And then you get this conversation between God and Satan concerning Job. Now, if you look at the conversation, God is bragging on Job, and Satan is accusing him of serving God for an ulterior motive. Are you ready for what I'm going to say? Never thought about this in 34 years of ministry. Why does it say there was a day when the sons of God came and Satan presented himself? Because in Jewish thought that goes all the way back to the time of Moses, there was a, uh, the, uh, the sixth moed, or sixth appointed season of Israel, is called Day of Atonement. 
On the Day of Atonement, it's the day when Satan makes accusations directly in the face of God against God's people. And so on this day, which would have been the Rosh Hashanah time frame, Satan is approaching the very throne of God to make an accusation against God's main man on earth at that time, who is Job himself. Now, someone says, well, are you saying, did Moses write this book? Wouldn't Moses have been greater than Job? Certainly if Moses wrote it, but no one knows who wrote it. Did Job write it? Did Moses write it? Did one of the early scribes or one of the early prophets write that particular book? So that's one of the questions that people have about who wrote the book of Job. The point is that according to Hebraic thought, Rosh Hashanah, which is called the Day of Atonement, is the day when the adversary is permitted to accuse Israel in front of God. So there was a day when the sons of God came, and the sons of God is Bini Elohim, which are the angels, and they're coming before God, and they're accusing Job. Now here's what happens. I want you, I want to pay, I want you to pay careful attention to this. All of a sudden, Satan says to God, if you will stretch forth your hand or put forth now your hand, touch all he has, Job will curse you to, his fa to, to your face. Now, when you read this in the English Bible, put forth your hand, we think it means that Satan is saying to God, take your hand and move it and hit Job with your hand. That's not what it means there. Now, watch what I'm going to, uh, going to do. Re if I were to say to someone, remove your hand, we know what that means. But if I were to say, stretch your hand forth, we think it means to go forward with it that way. Literally, what Satan is saying to God is, take your hand that's on him and move your hand, not on him, but away from him. See, his li oh my. I have a friend of mine in Texas, Lamarck, Texas, Walter Hallam, that taught me this. He said, Perry, People, don't, people misunderstand what it means when we talk about the judgment of God because they think that God is in heaven just looking at something saying, I think I'll attack that, but I won't attack that. Well, that looks bad, so let me get that. See, the hand of God, as long as the hand of God is on you, the favor of God is on you. As long as the hand of God's on you, the blessing of God is on you. As long as the hand of God is on you, the enemy is not able to get in because it forms a protective hedge the way it did with Job. However, if God ever lifts his hand, that's when the hedge is removed and the enemy is able to come in even it could be natural disasters, it could be difficulties that come, attacks of satanic powers. So as long as the hand of God is on something, Satan can't get in it. But if the hand of God is lifted, he can get in. See, Satan knew there was a hedge around Job. The word hedge there is a very interesting word because it, it's like creating a barrier or creating a stronghold or a fortress around someone. Now, there's been debates for years as to what was the hedge that God put around Job. Some people said, well, it was a thorn bush. Well, listen, a thorn bush is not going to keep a devil out. You understand? A devil's a spirit. In the book of Psalms, it says, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear God and deliver them. And I believe that that encampment round about is what Job had. He had an encampment of angels around about his property, round about his family, round about him. And the enemy tried to get in and could not get in because the angels encamp around about those that do what? Say it. Fear the Lord. And so what did Job do? He feared the Lord. So he fits the pattern of an individual that could have angelic protection. So in other words, God literally withdrew the angels of protection around his property, giving Satan permission to go in. Now here's what happens. Now stay with me because this, this is going to get very interesting here in a moment. Trust me. All of a sudden, the sub sudden number one, verse 15, the Sabine, Sabines came in and uh, began to attack. All, and uh, then the fire of God, verse 16, uh, came. And... Um, and destroyed the sheep. Verse uh, 17, number three, the Chaldeans came in in three bands, took the camels, carried them all away. Then the worst part that happened is verse 19, a wind came from the wilderness, smote the four corners of the house and fell upon the ten kids. Now I want you to imagine probably within a day of losing all ten children in your family, losing all the wealth that you had, no animal is left. Now you gotta, you've got to get this point. At that point of time, there was no blood sacrifice. What Satan took from Job, you got to remember, how was the hedge there? What kept the hedge up? What kept the hedge up was the fact that Job offered blood on an altar continually. Are you listening? Because in that day, the hedge would have been the sacrificial blood. Can I prove it? Right out here on the Temple Mount years ago, centuries ago actually, when, when uh, the angel of God was coming to destroy Jerusalem and had the sword out, remember the story? And how David built an altar on the threshing floor of Arnon the Jebusite, which is right there near the dome, where the dome is, the rock under the dome. And it says, after he put the blood offering out, the angel put his sword away. Do you know that on, in Exodus chapter 12, when it, when it talks about the blood of the lamb at Passover, the blood of the lamb kept the destroyer out of the house. So in other words, in the Old Testament time, the sacrificial blood of an animal was the protective hedge that kept the enemy out. So watch this. In the early part, he's got blood, 
His children are protected. 